Greetings from London. Um, so this is the outline of our talk. Uh, Lily will talk a little bit about Jewish languages, um, and I'll give an overview of the history of Jews in Finland and talk about the Jewish languages used by Jews in Finland. We've done a previous study on this, which Lily will sum up. So examples of past practices. We have our case study and then quick summary and conclusions. The image you see here is the synagogue in Helsinki from 1906. It's an Art Nouveau synagogue. And we're going to see a picture from the inside as well. So um, we've already talked a little bit about um, Jewish languages this afternoon, um, but just to give you um, a bit more of an overview for context of um, why we wanted to talk about um, Jewish Finnish languages um, in this respect. Um, I mean, as I think many people already know, um, diaspora Jewish languages, so that that is Jewish languages apart from Hebrew, um, belong to a wide variety of different language families. And some might say um, they have very little in common um, when you think that there are you know, languages as far apart as, let's say, Ladino, which is Romance, and um, Judeo-Georgian or um, Jewish Berber. But um, they all have a number of features that um, allow us to kind of um, put them in a separate category. If we could go to the next slide. Um, so generally the things that um, group Jewish languages together um, are for one, the use of the Hebrew alphabet for writing with very few exceptions. Obviously this isn't a linguistic um, category, but it's still something that um, you can often use as a tool for uh, kind of identifying which language has been adopted by a Jewish community. Um, they, they typically have incorporation of Hebrew and Aramaic elements, um, especially vocabulary, sometimes grammatical influence as well, and um, loanwords from other sources um, that kind of reflect the migrational patterns. So for example, um, there's a lot of Slavic vocabulary in Yiddish, which is a Germanic language. Um, there's a lot of Turkish vocabulary in Ladino because of the settlement patterns of the um, Jews speaking those languages. They often have distinctive features of pronunciation. Um, so they might have phonological features um, derived from Hebrew that don't exist in the non-Jewish sister language. Um, and they have their own um, grammatical features, often archaisms or dialectal features that um, have been lost from the non-Jewish sister varieties. Some of them are historical, like Judeo-French, which is known to us from the medieval period. Um, some of them are newly evolving, um, like Jewish English, which is a um, primarily a 20th and 21st century Jewish variety. Um, and they kind of exist on a continuum of mutual intelligibility with the non-Jewish sister language. So you might have um, something like Jewish English where um, on the one hand you have um, a variety that's when it's spoken um, with sort of not, with members um, not of the group, um, it, you can't really say that there's anything distinctively Jewish about it, but then when you move to in-group communication, it takes on more and more distinctive features so that you can might get to a point on the other end of the continuum where it's actually quite difficult for um, someone not from the Jewish community to understand it. Um, and the newer Jewish languages often have elements from older Jewish languages. So for example, Jewish English has a lot of Yiddish in it. Um, and then um, Latin American Jewish Spanish, which is another newer variety, has a lot of, or some Ladino in it. So there's kind of a mosaic of different historical varieties of Jewish languages. Um, Finland was part of, is considered to be, have been a part of Sweden for a long time until 1809. Um, and at that time, Jews were not allowed to settle in Finland. So the true religion uh, in, in, the, in both Sweden and Finland didn't really exist then, but it was Protestant Lutheran and there were meant to be no Jews there. Finland then became an autonomous Grand Duchy in the Russian empire. And in 1827, Tsar Nikolai I ordered Jews to serve in the Russian army. And some of them ended up settling in, in towns in southern Finland and became traders. And some of them also accumulated some wealth through, through trading. The first rabbi we had in 1867, and there's been a Jewish school from 1893. So from the start, it was a sec fairly secular, very small community that integrated and intermarried. I've simplified the history here. Some of them were also expelled. I should make this point during this period, but then on the whole, it was very small and, and they inter integrated and intermarried. Um, post uh, Finnish independence 1917, Jews were granted full citizens' rights. There was an active theater group and, and a sports society, the famous sports athletes, uh, Finnish Jewish athletes. Finland, um, 
uh, received 500 Jewish refugees from 1938 onwards, which is obviously positive, but also more recently, um, a darker side of to history has been discovered that eight Jews were handed over to Nazi Germany. And, and it is complicated because Finland uh, fought both uh, Soviet Union and, and Nazi Germany, and we did collaborate with Nazi Germany, but Finns always want to say that, oh, it was a, it was a military collaboration, not ideological, and then the discovery of these eight Jews has been um, a, a big deal. Finnish Jews served in the Finnish army and fought against Soviet Union, and there were Finnish Jews and then Nazi soldiers together. There was an article about this in the, in the Independence, it was an inter interesting period in history, and there were sort of synagogues in the, in the sort of front lines. A number of Jewish people arrived from Russia in the 1990s after the fall of Soviet Union, and there have been more recent migrants from Israel. But like I said, the community has always been very small. Um, it's about 1,200 in Helsinki, very heterogeneous group. So they're, they're from different, like these Jews that arrived in the 1800s, but the newer ones as well. Altogether is around 1,500, and there are two Jewish communities or congregations, one in Helsinki and one in Turku. And in terms of Jewish languages, in the start, in the 1800s, the language was Yiddish and Hebrew was used more as a religious context. And the last generation of, of Yiddish speakers died in the 70s and 80s. And they speculated, like, why would this be the case? Why there are no more speakers left? And uh, because it was so small, the community, they interacted with speakers, with speakers of Finnish and Swedish, and it was hard for them to learn the Hebrew alphabet, but it wasn't actively used. Russian was never really used in the past. It's used now. German had some prestige, um, like in other Jewish communities at the turn of the 20th century, and their Zionism increased interest in modern Hebrew. And there's still like a, at the moment, there is a Yiddish kind of club, and you can study Yiddish at university, and same with modern Hebrew. Uh, Jews who settled in central Helsinki mid 1800s started speaking Swedish. That was the language of the, of the capital. And it was the language of civil servants, intelligentsia, and, and I don't know, some slightly wealthier people perhaps. And uh, the language of secular subjects in the Jewish school was Swedish from the start, the school that I mentioned that was founded in 1893. And religious subjects were taught in Yiddish, partly because the teachers came from elsewhere. This community was so small. But the school switched to Finnish in, in the 1930s. And this is obviously, if you start teaching children in Finnish, they're going to be have very good Finnish skills and perhaps not so good skills in others. And reason was to guarantee support from the Finnish government. Um, there was pressure from the parents who felt that knowing Finnish would be useful. The general linguistic landscape or sort of situation in Helsinki changed. There were lots of migrants from the countryside, people, internal migrants who moved to the city and they were usually Finnish speakers. The majority, I'd like to remind you that 95% of Finns at the moment also speak Finnish and 5% only Swedish. There was a very nationalistic movement in the 1930s whereby I don't know, even Jewish sounding surnames, Russian sounding surnames, Swedish sounding surnames were changed to Finnish sounding surnames. And this is sort of part of that. And some people have speculated that it was hard for these people to have a double minority identity. They were both Swedish speaking and Jewish, so they switched over to Finnish. So this quadrilingual community, or maybe, I don't know, there were more languages, seven languages became predominantly Finnish speaking. And this is what we're gonna see in our case study. Really. Historically, um, the picture was quite different. Um, so in the 1940s, um, you can see from publications that were produced by the Jewish community in Finland that the main language um, was Swedish, and there was also quite a significant Yiddish element. Um, Finnish language content was rare, um, English was not used, um, and um, Hebrew and Yiddish were usually transliterated, um, which was both um, for practical reasons, um, and as in there were not, it was difficult to get access to Hebrew printing presses um, in Finland and also just because Hebrew already by this point was really not kind of widely, um, widely familiar. So they were usually Romanized. Um, and then the traditional Ashkenazic pronunciation was gradually being replaced by Israeli Hebrew pronunciation, which is a trend that you can see um, in neighboring Sweden as well in the Jewish community. So just a quick example here, you can see um, in, in the middle, the top, it says, um, which means I found a bargain and, and the bold phrase is, is Yiddish. Um, and then you can see some other um, Ashkenazic Hebrew pronunciation words um, that are also used in Yiddish appearing in the middle of the Swedish. Um, and then an announcement with some um, transliterated Hebrew and Hebrew in um, Hebrew script. 
Yeah, so that was our previous sort of case study from the 40s. So this and will contrast with what we're going to show you. What from we're going to show you now. So it's quite dramatic. So we looked at the Facebook page of the Jewish community in Finland. They do have an official publication as well, where we thought we'll look at the more kind of natural practices, not the printed uh, uh, Harke Hila uh, newspaper or, or, or journal. And we're going to look at the focus quickly just of recent posts. Um, and this is like a preliminary marks on what we could observe and, and also how the choice of language then relates to perhaps to the topics. Um, this qualitative content analysis, and we're only focusing on written language or so no spoken data. Here's just a map of Finland to fill that uh, empty space there. And here's this is from the inside the synagogue, and this is the Facebook page. And you can see that their logo, with their logo, they use four languages. So it's Finnish fast, um, then Swedish. Uh, and then uh, English, and then uh, that's uh, Hebrew, right? And what we're going to see here, this is the uh, Finnish Independence Day. Big deal in, in the Jewish community, and they've gone to visit the graves of soldiers uh, um, who fought in the, in the Second World War. And Finnish flags everywhere. It's all, all in Finnish, tiny bit of English there. And there's a section in Swedish. So these are the two official languages of Finland. So you will see mostly Finnish and a little bit of Swedish. And, and the conclusion is sort of the proportion of Swedish on this page is approximately matches that 95 to 5% um, proportion. This is an important event where they, um, these eight soldiers that were um, handed over to, to Nazi Germany, they're kind of reminiscing them. And this is also in English, a sort of global conscience. You kind of feel that best to use English perhaps for these purposes, but it's otherwise the, the poster is, is, or the kind of logo, the advertisement is in Finnish only. Here, a Jewish artist has died. Um, they're linking to the Finnish speaking um, newspaper. It's all in Finnish. The only kind of dramatic thing here is that the word for, for, for God has been shortened. So that would be the only, uh, Yumala is the long version, um, but here it's been in shortened and following sort of Jewish, Jewish tradition, but it's otherwise all in Finnish. Um, the one thing on the left you see is for the security of the synagogue and they're collecting money. It is an annual thing to collect money for, for, for that. And it's all in Finnish, um, nothing else. And on the right, you see kind of associations with, the, with Israel. So it's the Finnish government that has written a news item about Israel as a country of high technology. These people have shared it. The news was in English and they've commented on it in, in, in Finnish. Uh, so this is what we can see. The thing on the left, there were a large number of uh, newspaper items, all in Finnish, about anti-Semitism, and, and they're, they're sharing them and commenting on them. That's also in, in Finnish. And the one on the right is Yom Kippur. That happens to be in three languages, which is very rare. And it's a joke. Um, it, it's somewhat unexpected. But what you can see is that this is the general trend, that if the, if the new item that they shared on, on the Facebook page is in three languages. Like here, you'll get comments on, on all three languages. Um, one could also analyze the use of emojis on this page because they're very popular. You have, you have two more minutes. If you want to use them, Rita and Lily, you can, but two more minutes for questions and everything else. Okay, we'll be quick. Okay, so just quickly, another couple of points. Um, so there are a lot of posts about Jewish holidays. Um, which seem to be directed not only at members of the Jewish community, community but also at um, like kind of allies or, or friends of the Jewish community. Um, and those have explanations, um, usually in, in Finnish and then also um, in English, which seems to appeal to both a Finnish speaking non-Jewish audience, a Finnish speaking Jewish audience, and then a kind of international um, Jewish English speaking or reading audience. Um, and very rarely we have um, small elements in Hebrew like um this and then in the, in the next slide um we have this little um greeting for Yom Kippur Tzomkal, uh, which is like kind of productive fast and that's been translated um into Finnish um so um unusually we have a quote from um a rabbinic sage from the early common era the third or the fourth century in English only um which is which is kind of striking because um it seems to be part of this bigger trend that that English is seen as the sort of international Jewish language rather than Hebrew. So we um, skip these and go to conclusion? Yeah. Um, so just, um, I'll just talk a little bit about Chabad. The one exception to this trend is um, Chabad, which is um, a kind of um, ultra-Orthodox, a Hasidic outreach organization um, that, that um, sort of helps 
um, Jewish communities get involved in Jewish holidays and events and their language is English and this is designed to cater to the Israeli and um, Russian Jewish communities um, in Finland and it's unusual because their main language is English rather than Hebrew, um, which often would be the case for um, organizations targeting Israelis in other countries. So um, just to conclude, um, you can see here that in contrast to the earlier um, data from the 40s, Finnish is by far the dominant central language. Um, much of the audience, judging by the, the language and the comments and the explanations, seems to be made up of Finnish-speaking allies. Um, there's no evidence of a Jewish Finnish ethnolect, so no like different grammar or Hebrew Yiddish elements in the everyday writing, with the exception of that um, practice of abbreviating the word for God, um, which, is, which is a distinctly Jewish um, practice. Um, English seems to function as an international Yiddish lingua franca, uh, Jewish lingua franca. There's um, very little Hebrew, and it's usually Romanized, um, except for the logo of the community and the greeting, Chag Sameach, meaning happy holidays. Um, modern Hebrew has replaced Yiddish as a sort of symbolic Jewish language in those cases, and the proportion of Swedish is very low, so in keeping with the number of Swedish speakers today in Finland. Um, and we think that these preliminary findings might constitute an example of a wider trend whereby very small diaspora Jewish communities with a high degree of integration into the host society, like Finland, are, have kind of lost their linguistic distinctiveness, um, and it's been replaced by the majority language. Thank, Thank you. you.